Well, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. I'm Jeff McCreese. I'm the Deputy Director of the uh, Vice Admiral James Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership, and this is another installment in our Brain Science and Effective Leadership Speaker Series. It's a uh, great honor today uh, to welcome again Dr. Janine Stewart, an organizational systems neuroscientist from the Neuroleadership Institute. Uh, Dr. Stewart holds a PhD in psychology from the University of Virginia and served as a professor at Washington and Lee University in Lexington, Virginia, and the chief academic officer at uh, Hollins College in Roanoke before her time at the Neuroleadership Institute. And Dr. Stewart today will discuss the uh, Neuroleadership Institute's SCARF model, an acronym that investigates how the human brain reacts to uh, status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. Uh, Dr. Stewart will open with some prepared comments and then accept uh, questions and comments afterwards. Please pose questions in the chat box. And also please remember to uh, keep yourselves on mute unless you're speaking. So it's a great honor to welcome back to the uh, Naval Academy, Dr. Janine Stewart. Dr. Stewart, the, uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you so much. It's great to be back with everyone. Uh, as Jeff said, I am Janine Stewart with the Neuroleadership Institute. And we're gonna talk today about a model that NLI uses quite extensively called the SCARF model. When I was with you last October, for another program on uh, leadership and resilience, we, I actually leveraged this model a bit in my comments. So today we're gonna take a closer look at it and also give you some thoughts about how to work with this uh, from wherever you lead uh, in your day to day. So um, just, uh, just by way of quick introduction, I am located in the Charlottesville, Virginia area, just a, a couple of hours south of you. And um, the, the land that I am on as we convene from this uh, virtual location is the traditional land of the Monacan and Manahoac people. To, uh, to get the most out of today's session, just a few notes for you. Uh, try not to multitask. I, I realize the, uh, the reality that we are all working with, which is there are so many things competing for our attention. So I'll just put it this way, to the extent that you can, do close out the extra browser windows, put the phone on silent and, and maybe a little out of reach, turn it upside down if the messages are flashing. Just try to, to minimize some distractions so that you can get the most out of the time we have together. We'll be together until the top of the, of the next hour. I'll encourage your participation throughout the presentation. Um, and the way that we'll do that is by using the chat window uh, I'll also encourage you to grab a pen and paper because I've got a couple of questions for you that are just for you, just for self-reflection. So you may want to make a note. Uh, there, there are a couple of things that I'll position up front and then you may want to revisit after I've shared some more content. So make some notes for yourself on pen and paper. Those notes that you make for yourself are for your eyes only. We'll hold those in confidence. And, um, and I will not ask you to share them. So as I mentioned, we'll use the chat window quite a bit. And, um, and actually, this is a, a very important element that I'll connect directly to the SCARF model in a few moments. So let me start with our first exercise, uh, which is um, open the chat if you would, and just share one thing that you've done recently to, to just uh, reset and recharge yourself. What are you doing to stay sane? Um, just enter that in the chat if you would. And this is actually important. So I'll tell you why in a moment, but oh gosh, I love the ideas that are flowing already. Running, biking, connecting with family, rebuilding a barn, Brian, how interesting. Uh, float tank, Bob, oh gosh, what a great idea. And I, I have done that, I, not in a while, but I love it. What a great idea. Uh, working out with the roommate, Phil, great idea. Zane says running. Steven says cleaning closets and reorganizing, uh, cleaning things out, cleaning out the clutter. That's a great idea. Bible and prayer, Jacob, wonderful. So we've got things ranging from meditation to physical activity to cleaning, cleaning out and cleaning up to uh, um, physical and mental challenges like rebuilding a barn. All great. Now here's what's important to note. I'm gonna connect what we've just done, this quick exercise in the chat to the concept of relatedness uh, in a little while. 
and here's the main point that I want to share with you, especially in times where so many of our meetings have to be remote and have to be via Zoom or Teams or other platforms like this one. It's actually really important to take a moment up front to connect with one another on a human level. And, and that may not sound surprising, but there is actually science behind it. And, and um, I'll share a little bit of the, a few tidbits related to the science as we go forward. For now, just be aware that it's important to look at people's names, see what they're doing, connect to them as whole people to the extent that we can. So scroll up and down in the chat, take a look at what people have shared. And, uh, and I'll share gratitude to you now for, for doing that. Um, now, we've got a few key objectives today, focusing on this all important SCARF model. I'm gonna start off by explaining how we enter, how we enter into thinking about this SCARF model. And it comes from our sense of the brain's primary organizing principle. So as we, uh, as we talk about this thing, this five part model called, that we call SCARF, we're really starting with what is the brain designed to do? What's its primary job? So be thinking about that. I'm going to ask for your thoughts on that in a moment. And then I'm, I'm going to introduce the SCARF model itself. It is a five-part model. And SCARF is an acronym for Status, Certainty, Autonomy, Relatedness, and Fairness. And we'll see that this gives us a, a simple way of thinking about the complexities of human interaction. There are five main ways that we show up socially with one another, and we either offer support or the opposite of that. So we'll, we'll debrief and talk about that in a moment. But then we'll also apply that model once we've got that common language, how can you turn it into a leadership tool to support and sustain high level engagement? How do you help each other stay in the game cognitively as it were? Now I've got an initial question for you to ponder. And this is a moment to pull out your pen and paper and make a note for yourself. That here are five ways that any of us, myself included, any of us can sometimes get it wrong when we're trying to lead effectively. I'm going to pause and just ask for everyone to check that they're on mute. And um, I know our host can mute you in the background as well, but um, it's easiest if, if we each just check and see um, that we're on mute. Um, Kathy, I'm going to ask that you uh, please mute in the background those who are making uh, noise and not realizing it. Thank you. Um, so, so here's my question for you. Uh, jot down the one that is that is something you know you've done at, at some point. One one thing we'll see and we'll we'll uh, acknowledge before we're done today is that when we're under stress, our best intentions sometimes don't hit the mark. So, as uh, some of us may find that a little more than we would like. We may be dismissive of others' contributions. And, and obviously a big part of what... Maybe we're in a hurry um, and uh, or trying to get a lot done in a meeting and someone tries to make a point and we think we don't have time for that. Sometimes we're unclear or vague with our expectations. Uh, it happens. We think we've been clear, but we haven't. Micromanaging, we all have an inner micromanager. So give that some thought. And sometimes we're focused so, so directly on, on the outcomes that, uh, that we miss other opportunities perhaps to check in with people as, as human beings. And finally, we don't mean to, but sometimes when we're reporting out on the work of a team, it looks like we might be taking credit for others' work. So make a note for yourself. One of those may resonate. And we'll come back to this later in the session. I just wanna position that now and come back to this, this primary issue that I'd mentioned, our first objective is understanding what's the brain's primary organizing principle. Now, if you had to make a guess, what is the brain's main job? Go ahead and enter it in the chat. Uh, what's the brain's primary job above all others? We call it the organizing principle because as we're organizing and sorting information that's coming into our central nervous system, We've got to sort it in a way that preserves our survival, absolutely, or our safety. Keep the trains running on time, right? Prioritize our bodily functions. Keep, keep ourselves upright. 
Okay, so that's that's really ultimately the brain's primary organizing principle is is whatever I'm moving toward going to keep me alive, or is it going to challenge me in some way? Should I stay away? So we can think of it this way, and this is a quote from the Neuroleadership Institute's founder, David Rock. He says, everything you do in life is based on your brain's determination to minimize danger or maximize reward. So, so that, that primary organizing principle of keeping ourselves alive really boils down to a series throughout the day of evaluations, um, a go, no go decisions, if you will. Am I, am I going to experience more threat if I move in a certain direction or less threat or flipped, flip that to the positive or more reward? So we end up with this two-sided arrow and I'm gonna use that image throughout uh, to talk about how it is that our brain is making judgments and adjustments throughout, throughout our day. As we, as we um, conduct that analysis, uh, at a neurological level, and this is happening very unconsciously, by the way, there are a few things that emerge as a result of getting it right. So when our brains are getting it right, organizing the information well, and, and doing a great job of keeping us in the safer zone, we benefit. We benefit in terms of things we can see more directly at work. For example, our perception is sharper. Our what cognition works better. <laughs> I'm gonna pause once again and ask people to please uh, check their mute. Thank you so much. Um, our cognitions are better, our, our collaborations, we're, we're more interested in collaborating with others and partnering with one another. And we're, we're likely to be more, more creative, more likely to lean into an opportunity um, to create something new and different. Those are things we can't afford to do if we're under severe threat. Now our brain does one more thing that's worth keeping in mind. And you may recall this from last October if you attended that session as well. As I had mentioned then, our brains have a tendency to over-index on anything negative. So, uh, so you'll notice uh, the threat side of the arrow is expanded here to reflect that. So this primary organizing principle also gives an edge to anything risky, why? Well, because we really can't afford to end up in a dire threatening situation. If we get that wrong, we could die. We could be dinner for a predator. If we get a reward wrong, well, we just might miss out on dessert. So that's, that's a lower, lower risk level. Um, so our brain automatically controls for that and expands on anything threatening. So I wanna bring this back to the scarf model now. Here's our two-sided arrow. We've got uh, the propensity to recognize and stay away from threats and to recognize and move toward rewards. How do we do that when human interaction is so complicated? The SCARF model is, is the way. So it gives us a simple rubric, a model for thinking about how am I showing up with others? What's working well? What might be challenging? So let's come back to those five elements, status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness and fairness, those five things, that's what we're calling SCARF. And each element, each domain of the SCARF model helps us think about how we can either support or disappoint one another. So starting with status, status is about ways that we signal to others that we value them or sometimes miss the mark. So it's any way that we get a signal or a sense that we are less than or better than others in our environment. Certainty, certainty is what it sounds like. It's our ability to predict what comes next. So it's what to expect. It could be something as simple as having an agenda for a meeting uh, or a clear description of what's going to happen when we enter a room with other humans. Uh, autonomy, autonomy is any way we get a sense of control. And it can be large or small. Once again, on the, on the small side, think about the value that, that comes from understanding we have to have a meeting maybe with our, our boss or superior, but we do have a choice of whether to do that Friday or Monday. So uh, autonomy can be a, a small way that we have choice or it, it could be larger. Relatedness is any way we feel that we're part of the group. When we know we've got our people, we're among our people, we have that strong sense of in-group, that's a very powerful thing. 
And it can be signaled in a variety of ways, including wearing the Navy uniform. So you wear the uniform and you know that you're part of the group. You see someone else wearing the uniform and you know. Um, you see someone wearing insignia, uh, even if they are not in full uniform, and you have a point of contact or common commonality that allows you to open a conversation. Have you served? Where did you serve? When? Um, and, and build from there. So knowing you're part of an in-group is a very powerful thing. A lot of questions fall away, right? So certainty goes up when we know someone is part of our in-group. Relatedness is a very key element of this model. We'll spend a little more time with that in a moment. Finally, fairness. Now, fairness is also a, a, a critical and interesting part of the model. It's any way that we, we perceive that we will be treated fairly uh, in a group. So all day, every day, we are evaluating how we're doing in these five ways. And we had sent out a survey. I know uh, when, you, when you received the invitation for this session, you had the opportunity to, uh, to do a little survey that we offer. We'll share that again if you haven't done it yet. You don't have to have done the survey to answer my next question. So in the chat, if you would, um, share with us which one of these categories, which one of these five rises to the top for you, feels most important to you. We should see all five pop up in the chat, right? Because we're different. We all care about all five, but we, we each have our favorite, if you will. So let's, let's let those flow in the chat. And we'll get a sense of the variety of responses. And, and I notice a few folks feel as I do where there's a tie. I've got two at the top. And actually, Dawn, I'm with you. Relatedness and fairness are my two. Uh, Travis has autonomy and status. So sometimes we've got a pair that are tied for top place. But for many of us, we would find, for example, um, Dagan mentioned certainty. So I'm gonna assume then that if Dagan's having a good day, there probably was, um, there were some certainty rewards built in or limited opportunities for dramatic uncertainty, which can be very unsettling. For Mariana, a good day would have probably involved a good amount of fairness rewards. Um, just being reassured that the group is actually being treated consistently and fairly. Now, here's one reason fairness is particularly interesting. And for those of us who have it near the top, think about this. And I'd love more comments or questions in the chat at any time. But fairness is interesting because I can see someone else in my group be treated unfairly. And I feel it as if that was my moment of unfair treatment. So fairness spreads. It has that potential to spread and affect everyone who's present or everyone who's aware, even if they weren't the direct target of an unfair act. So fairness is very interesting. Um, Jacob mentions results and status. And let me affirm the value of that, Jacob, and thanks for sharing that. It's actually really important to know where we stand sometimes, right? And so for a lot of us, just knowing that, having the results, getting the data, winning the race. If you're an athlete, member of the athletics program at the Naval Academy, perhaps you have that feeling as well, that status is really important. Wins and losses matter. And, uh, and of course they do. It matters to all humans, but for some of us, it matters more. Let's see, uh, certainty, relatedness, and fairness. Uh, Chief LaRue mentions three, three that go together, and absolutely these can go together. And as we talk about this more, just to build on the Chief's um, comment here, we're going to see that the SCARF model is actually a system. So it is hard to separate out one thing and say, all I none of us is saying all I care about is certainty. But what we'll start to notice is if I really care about certainty and want to offer it to others, I may also need to be working on relatedness and fairness. And otherwise, I, if I don't work on the fairness piece, I'm gonna lose the relatedness piece. Without the relatedness piece, I can't support the certainty. So we're gonna see some nice nuance and flow among these categories. I'm confident of that. Let me pause here and just see any comments or questions in the chat. I'll just give a pause, take a breath, take a sip of water before I pr proceed. Hmm. Eric, I love this. Relatedness, tribalism versus community. Great question. 
Um, so humans are inherently tribal creatures. We'll notice that some of the some of the themes we're talking about here come back to how did our brains evolve? And I've got a couple of examples coming up that will get to that. We've got to acknowledge we have some propensities as humans because we evolved certain neural circuitry that helped us stay safe and alive. So remember, our brain's primary organizing principle is to keep us alive. That means we are indeed bringing these old evolved, <laughs> these old brains that were evolved for the hunter gatherer era, we bring those to work every day and to school every day. So, so that's part of the reality. So our modern challenge, just to build on your comment a bit more, Eric, and then we can pursue it later at the end if we have time. Um, our modern challenge is to how do, we, how do we create an inclusive environment when our brains are saying, keep me safe by keeping me in my little bubble of people who look like me. So that's a challenge that we need to work through. Let's keep that in mind as we look at how to work with the SCARF model in a moment. I think that's a great question. Is it common for the results to all be pretty close? Actually, it is, Brianna. It, it varies. We are all different. Some people have a clear favorite. Many of us do not. Um, and it, I think that depends to some degree on the extent to which we are thinking at it at more of a, a systems level as we're answering those quick questions. It's just a, a fun little survey. Um, and some of us have something clear in mind. Like it may be that as you're as you're doing that assessment, yesterday was a day that you were competing in a track and field event. And so maybe status is higher for you because you've been immersed in some related concepts. So just as an example. Um, and might these break out differently in high risk communities? This is, uh, et cetera, Bob, great question. I, I'm actually um, offering a, um, I'm gonna participate in a panel this weekend that gets at that question, looking at, um, uh, people who, who do uh, cybersecurity uh, jobs, and there may be some people on this uh, line who, who are involved in that kind of work. Um, it's high stress work. And so anyone who's in high stress situations all the time have a, have a reset or a higher set point in terms of stress and threat. And I'm gonna talk in a moment about blending external threats with this sense of internal threat. And I think that will help us to get some nuance into that kind of question. Um, Noel, a uh, great question about perception. Indeed, it is the perception of fairness. Uh, we can use rewards in other domains to, to help to even the playing field. So to your question, uh, we have people who have different um, uh, thresholds for seeing a situation or perceiving a situation a certain way. We can work to increase certainty, transparency in our communication, and build relatedness so we can get feedback about how things are coming across. And that combination is likely to help to level out those differences in the fairness domain. So again, we're building a system here across the five elements of SCARF. And it means that we sometimes can go to a different domain to raise certainty or to raise rewards overall. We call that an offsetting effect in order to level out threat in another domain. So that may sound complicated. It'll make more sense as I give a few more examples. Um, yeah, and Jacob, uh, I'll give you my honest answer. You ask, how do you value the test versus what we thought about ourselves just reading these five? I think the test gives us an easy way to, an easy and quick way to go through this. We've just taken longer, 20 minutes talking through it. The test takes less time. Um, they're equally valid is my scientist's answer. Um, uh, Eric, to some degree, yes, tribalism can be fear-based and community can, uh, does require empathy. So I, I like this theme, we're gonna come back to that. Um, do, the, do the principles play out differently, Chloe, in work versus, versus home, I'll say, in professional versus personal? They don't, your examples will be different, but the five are still relevant. You may have a different favorite though in the different domains. So coming back to Jacob's question about the, um, about the validity of our little assessment, um, you will see, you may see different results in personal versus professional. So a lot of this is situational. We're really talking about lenses, five lenses we can use to look at the way we show up socially. 
So let me push forward and build on this concept of working with SCARF as a system, because I think this will be helpful and useful, uh, useful to you. So, so again, we've got these five social domains. We've just had a conversation about some that we're recognizing tend to be at the top for us in different circumstances. I want to I want to talk about each of these in turn. So um, and just give a just a little more context. What I'd love for you to do is keep in mind the note that you made earlier, that one, two, three, four, five, which leadership challenge kind of resonated for you. Um, and let's think about that challenge through the lens of status, fairness, I'm sorry, status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. Make a few notes for yourself, expand on, on your insights about how you show up and what pushes you to be at your best, what can sometimes hold you back from being at your best as we go forward. So, so I'm going to go through each scarf element in turn now, and I'll just give, I'll give a couple of examples of how this can show up in a workplace. I, I've got an example. You'll see some text related to a resource development resource challenge that I faced when I was a leader. I was a dean in a, in a college years ago. Um, and, and there were some reactions that I can look at through the lens of, of SCARF. You're doing the same thing on pen and paper as we go forward. So status. This is people around me, people around you thinking, well, am I respected and valued and how do I know? Now I was once overseeing a project and we lost a lot of funding, a lot of resources were taken away. So, so there were reactions I was witnessing that, that indicated people were feeling challenged by that. As people felt challenged by the loss of resources for a work-related project, the reality is some people felt less valued. Their money had, gone, had been taken away and they thought that was their work, their identity being undermined. So, some strategies that are available to us when people have a reaction, and remember, they're not necessarily going to put this in a memo or tell their boss this is exactly how they're feeling. It's a reaction. It might be brief, but you have opportunities to offer rewards always. So some rewards could be just being really explicit with people about the value they bring and how wonderful their input is. Now, I'm going to give you an example here, something we can look at together. And it's, it's going to give us another way of thinking about status, how subtle it can be. So I've got a puzzle here. And I'm showing you an image. Um, some of you may have seen this image before, although it's, it's a little unusual. I don't usually encounter people who've seen it. But if you've seen it before and know what it is, please hold back. I'd love for people to just have a chance to puzzle over this. Consider what it might be. Just keep looking at it. And without saying what it is, if you think you know, if you think you see the pattern in there, know what that image is, just type yes in the chat. Just yes. And just give it a moment here. Usually there are a few people who've got a, a, an idea early. What do we think that is? Just type yes if you think you know. Couple of yeses. Any others? Just to give, give you a few more seconds. Okay, so we've got three yeses. And would the three of you just type what you think you see in the chat if you're game? It's a puzzle, right? So if you're game. What do you think? So Shirley's got, that's a common one, Shirley, maybe land and water. Ah, dog. And Zane, do you have a guess? Man's face, it's a good one. Um, I'm not sure, your name is, uh, is, a, is a Zoom name. So I'm gonna guess, is it Rami or Ramir? And I wonder if you can come off mute. Carolina, love it. No, not Carolina. Dog was close. Dog was close. Okay, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show everyone. Then I want to talk about this from the lens of status. So there it is. It is a dog. So good guess. Good guess on the dog. It's a bulldog with a cap. Now, here's the thing. This is called an insight puzzle, right? Because once you get it, I can go back and it's like, oh, yeah, there's the dog. There's the nose. There's the cap. I got it. Once you see it, you don't unsee it. So we call that an insight puzzle. But here's the thing. 
I don't like insight puzzles. I, Janine, do not like insight puzzles. I don't feel that I'm very good at them. And so when I see these things pop up in a workshop, I go, my brain goes right to status threat. I'm not gonna be the best. And I opt out. Ah, still can't see it, Angela. So there's the original, or there's the, the strange image and here's the full image. So you see the, the nose over here to the right, the bill of the cap. Carolyn, you are my people. Carolyn, Angela, you are my people. So what a lot of us do, what happens when people look at a puzzle and go, I'm not gonna get that? What do you do? And it's low stakes, right? Your job doesn't depend on this. Your grade in the class doesn't depend on this. What happens? You shut down. Absolutely, Noel. Disengage. And in fact, I'm going to say, say it's dumb. I'm with you, Travis. So we, we go, oh, I'm out. What if you're good at this? Thanks, Angela. Thanks for, keep, for still trying. Good back and forth. So what if you're good at this? What if you're good at this kind of puzzle? Right, you get excited, right? You lean in. So there's your example. It's, it's the reward. It's, I'm going to get it. I'm going to win. People are going to see me win. They're going, ah, yes. So when we are boosted repeatedly with a given type of task, we expect that status reward. We're all in. But for those of us who recognize some of that as not our moment, we opt out. And in fact, we're using autonomy there, which we'll come to next. I want to keep going in order. Let's talk about certainty. I also develop a certainty when I see those kinds of puzzles that I am not. I am not gonna get the information I need, I'm out. So when my certainty, in order to protect myself from having multiple threats, I use a cognitive strategy of checking out, I disengage in order to avoid the, the status challenge of that puzzle. Now let's talk about certainty. Certainty is everywhere and uncertainty is everywhere. Um, now back to my resource example, I'll give my quick example there at work. People were uncertain how they were going to get their work done when the, when the funds got cut. They still had a job to do. So how could I support them? I could support them one way is by increasing certainty about what was expected um, and what, what was not. Maybe some things had changed and we, we should be clear about that. So certainty is any ability to predict what's coming next. It could be the agenda for a meeting that gives me certainty. We face uncertainty a lot in this era. We are facing it day after day, week after week. What are some examples of uncertainty in the pandemic era? Because this is adding up for us. Where might there be ambiguity or uncertainty? Feel free to share in the chat a couple of examples. Yeah, will I be able to pay my bills? Um, will I get a vaccine? When? Um, when will we gather again? Are, how many strains are out there? Will I be able to compete? So, so many, so many questions. It's really hard. Yeah, will I be able to see my children and family? So the list, the list can go on, right? Uncertainty is so big. How do we begin to deal with that? One thing I'll note, and I've got a little exercise to show you. Uncertainty is very, very difficult. I'm gonna show you some slides next. Got a handful of slides. It's just a visual, a set of visual images. There's no, no puzzle, actually. I'm gonna tell you exactly what I'm showing you, but it's gonna create some uncertainty in your brain. And I'm gonna tell you now to try this. As I show you the next set of slides, don't question the unknown, just accept it. Okay, ready? That's my instruction for you. Just accept what I'm showing you. Don't question it. So here's a checkerboard. You should see a checkerboard with two squares marked A and B. There's a green cylinder on the board and it's casting a light shadow across the middle of the board, okay? I'm now showing you two bars. These bars are a color standard. I'm gonna use them because you'll note, I've got boxes marked A and B where A looks darker than B. B looks light, A looks dark. Now, whoops, now I come up with a color standard. You know what's coming next. I'm gonna put the color standard over the checkerboard. So you notice wherever the, the standard bars have no boundary, no perceived boundary with an adjacent square, they're the same color. So look again at A and B and look at those bars. What do you notice? A and B are the same color as the bars 
they're the same color as each other. But knowing that does not change it, does not change what you see. So A, and A looks darker than B. Here come the bars. I lay the bars on top. A and B are the same color, but that's not what our brain registers. Our brain still registers A as darker than B. I'm confident that that is true for the majority of us. Maybe there are one or two people who are seeing that differently. But let's take away everything else from the field except the A and the B square. And now you can see, in the absence of any other information visually, A and B are the same color. But I'll point out once again that knowing that does not change it. And even with the bars on top, it's hard to see A and B as exactly the same color. So what you notice about my, my admonition that you should not question the unknown? Anyone find that compelling? I often have people who want to see it again and again. What thoughts do you have? Because here's what's happened with, the, with uncertainty. When people see something and they learn a little bit of information, but it doesn't seem to give them everything they know, it's hard to trust you've got all the information. And so, and so there's an unknown, right, Brianna? There's an unknown and we will solve for the unknown. In fact, it's hard to distract ourselves. It's hard to commit to not asking, to not questioning. We feel the pull. If you didn't feel the pull, I'd be surprised. It's possible some of you didn't. But the majority of us, want we want to know more. We want to get that context, right? Everything is relative to the context. You're right, Eric, it is. So it's just hard to stop questioning why, to stop asking, what's the context? Why are my eyes behaving that way? Whenever there's an unknown, we are wired, if you will, to solve for the unknown. And we will work extra hard. In fact, we have a hard time shutting it off. So uncertainty is actually worse than a known bad, right? I had to look away from the image to avoid questioning it. That's a, that's a brilliant observation, Brianna, thank you. So it's hard, right? And in fact, autonomy, we have to use our autonomy as Brianna did to come up with a way to break away from our brain's desire to work the puzzle. Right? I've got to work, for, work to get that unknown resolved. So autonomy is really important too. Autonomy is any feeling of being in control, having some degree of uh, opportunity to make my own choice. It means I'm trusted. It comes back to that tribal unit, right? It, if I'm trusted, then I'm part of the tribe. Then I'm part of the in-group. It feels supportive. People may not feel supported if they feel their project is the only one that lost money. So to come back to my one example, what do I have to work with as a leader in that circumstance? I can offer some autonomy reward by asking, okay, if this is our reality, how do you wanna proceed? So often it's a rhetorical, it's a simple, subtle rhetorical thing that I can offer in order to help people to reset. And I wanna build on this with relatedness. As I mentioned earlier, this is one of the most important categories for us. Um, relatedness is, is one we think of as at NLI as a, a universal offset or a way of offsetting threat in any domain. As I mentioned earlier, SCARF gives us a nice system to work within. So relatedness is a good go-to category for supporting or restoring ourselves and others. Whenever there's any type of threat, anything new comes along, we think we're moving along, we're, we're progressing, for example, through the pandemic era, and then we have to do another lockdown. And it can feel so disheartening when that happens. Relatedness can help us, even though that may have been an autonomy threat, a certainty threat, a status or fairness threat, could be a variety of things going on. Relatedness always helps. So it's any way we can see that we, we understand each other, we are understood by one another, and we're part of an in-group. It's a, a great way of knowing that we matter. So everyone is always categorizing themselves and understanding themselves in relation to others. Back to Eric's excellent point about it being about context, right? Context always matters. Am I part of the group? To come back to my little example, 
from my own leadership experience, um, a team might feel that a decision that was hard for them was made without hearing their concerns. They didn't have input. And so they may feel left out, like this happened to me by some other group. And so it heightens that sense of us and them in a way that might not be helpful in terms of moving forward. So as a leader, what can I do that's a relatedness reward? Well, I can acknowledge their feelings. I can listen, reflect back and say, I heard you and maybe open a discussion or a dialogue if that's appropriate. Um, about how, the, how support might flow. But we can think about relatedness in personal and professional domains. Think about any way we have a sense of being part of an in-group or any way that we might get a signal that we're not fully embraced by the group. So there are a few things that flow from this. And I actually have, I have a great little example that comes from a research study just to help us get a sense of what happens, what's the experience. Think about, just notice your feelings as I just run through this and let me set this up. I've got a, an image here. You are the, the person in the blue shirt. Each of us can put ourselves in the picture. You are the person in the blue shirt with their back to the screen. You're playing a game of catch with a couple of other participants. We'll call this game Cyberball. And in fact, this was, was a study, this comes from a study that was done at the UCLA by Naomi Eisenberger and her colleagues. And Dr. Eisenberger wanted to understand what goes on in the brain when people are feeling rejected by others or excluded. So this is the game they set up and they had people play this game, setting up pretty much the way we're looking at it. You're the person in the blue shirt, but you would be in an fMRI machine where uh, your, your uh, brain energy patterns are being recorded as you're playing the game. And so here you are playing and uh, you're believing, this is key too, uh, Eisenberger told, told participants, those other two people you see represent other participants in other fMRI machines elsewhere in the lab. Okay, so there you are, three participants playing a game. Somewhere along the way, a change is made and now notice what happens. You have just been left out of the game. So about halfway through the game, this happens. You're no longer playing catch, even though you're available and interested. And in truth, those other two people were just computers, not surprisingly, that's uh, Eisenberger had set it up so that the person would have the sense of being in, some, in a situation with other humans, but that wasn't entirely true. Now, what happened in the brain? when the person is excluded. Some of you may be noticing how you feel. Actually, I'd love that. In the chat, just notice if you noticed a feeling when you stopped playing ball, how did that feel? Confused, what else? Hurt, yeah, what else? Confused, hurt, perplexed, annoyed. Okay, so we have different reactions and that was true for Eisenberger's subjects as well. When she looked at the brain, what was noteworthy, yeah, what about me? So what was noteworthy is the region of the brain that lit up and, and it's highlighted in orange or yellow here. It's, it's okay if you don't read scans like this all the time. The essential, the essential message is if, if you were poked with a needle, you'd get the pattern of, uh, of the pattern shown under pain symptoms on the right. If you were left out of a game of catch, you'd get the pattern shown under social distress on the left. They look very similar. In fact, it's the same brain region that lights up. There's been additional research done uh, over the years since, since this um, study was done. And in fact, it's true over and over, our brains react as though we're under physical threat, that was as if we're in pain when we are left out of a social situation. And Francis, you're right. There are other, other uh, signals, other elements of a scene, more to the context that might also give us a sense of fear, or heighten our sense of fear um, or, or threat. So let me finish this out with fairness and then we'll put this back into a system again um, and talk about how we can use this. Do I get the credit and opportunities others do? That's the fairness question, that's essential. I've already mentioned fairness can be uh, felt across groups. 
So a project team in my circumstance, um, as I mentioned, may have felt um, unfairly treated if all the other project teams didn't lose their funding at the same time. How can I help them? I, I can't undo the budget changes, but I can use certainty, and that's actually the comment I've got here, being transparent with the process, allowing time for questions and listening. So that's a combination of certainty and fairness. It's also going to be easier to do that if I've been paying attention to relatedness all along. So we've got a whole system operating here. So again, look at what you've written down on your piece of paper and some of the things we've just talked through. If you're comfortable doing this, I'd love to just know in the chat, what's one SCARF category that you're thinking about as a go-to place that you could use to support others through challenging times? So remember, it's a system. I might be upset because I felt I was not treated fairly. Your reward for me might come from relatedness or certainty or status, could come from another domain. So what do you see as your best opportunity to signal to others that they do matter to you? That's your go-to, one of your go-to strategies, right? So a lot of certainty and relatedness right off the bat, maybe some status. If you're in a position to offer that, it's great. Um, so absolutely, in this system, all five matter, and any of the five can offset a threat in one domain. We'll also note that threats across multiple domains multiply. We call that the multiplier effect easily enough. So, so now we've got this incredibly complex human system. Each of us brings one to work every day and takes one home every day. And sometimes that's all happening in the same four walls, but it's complicated. And yet here are some tools we can use to help manage this because this is going to help people stay in the game, um, be as productive as possible. So a few, a few key notes here. First, let's look again at that two-sided arrow and at this notion of threat and reward and understand that our goal is not to erase all threat. That would make no sense, first of all. Um, what we want is to make sure that whatever threat we are carrying around with us <laughs> day to day is manageable. If, um, in fact, let me position it this way. If threat were at zero or picture yourself at the far right end of the reward blue arrow all the way out at the tip, here's how I picture that. That is me blissed out on a beach with a martini or a Mai Tai or no beverage at all, just blissed out on the beach. So that's not ideal for solving problems. I like having challenge, most of us do. So I wanna be somewhere in the middle, I just don't wanna be overwhelmed. And that's what we're going for as we think about supporting people with SCARF rewards. We're thinking about helping them stay in an adaptive zone in the middle of this two-sided arrow so that when their threats are manageable, they're able to experience peak performance. They're able to be engaged and motivated and maybe motivate others. Um, they're able to maintain high focus, right? Yeah, and actually, Bob, great point. There's a role here. There's a role for each of these. Think about defense versus offense, right? Um, think about different roles that you play in a, in a game, on a playing field, or at work when you and the people around you need different kinds of support in order to move through a crisis or something really challenging. So when supporting people, this is a good question, Stephen, when supporting people, wouldn't the best domain to use be the one that matters the most to the individual? Perhaps, and I'll say, I'll give it a yes and. Um, yes, it's great. If you know somebody really loves relatedness rewards more than anything else, and you can offer that, that's great. If they really love relatedness rewards, and what you have to work with, maybe because of your leadership status position relative to theirs, maybe what you have to work with is mostly right now in a status and certainty uh, category. Go there because any of the five domains will work in terms of helping to move someone back to an adaptive middle zone so they can stay functional. So it's a great question, but it doesn't, don't let perfect be the enemy of good, as they say. Any of the five rewards in any or all of the five categories will offset any threat. 
And that's a really empowering thing to know, because of course, I'm gonna complicate it further, but just for a moment, <laughs> just to acknowledge threat doesn't just come from within. It doesn't just come from our perceptions. There are some real stressors coming from without. We were identifying a few of them earlier, just in the pandemic era. So I've got a, uh, I had shared this in October. If you weren't with us for the October session, I just wanna give a, a quick note to, um, or highlight uh, of this concept here, because it's useful. We can think about what's going on, on the, in the outside world that's impacting our ability to function right now. And whatever that is may be extreme and it may be mild. So I'm gonna give those numbers. So one is mild. It's something I'm aware of, a threat, we'll call threat, a threat with a small t, something I'm aware of that's in my broader environment, but it's not distracting me or causing me to panic. Um, so let's consider that uh, a situation where, for example, I want to go hiking this weekend. I'm aware I live in the Blue Ridge Mountains, beautiful region. I, I'm aware uh, in the summer uh, and in the drier seasons, I'm aware of the fire threat. So I check that before I go hiking. I'm aware of it, but I still go hiking. Uh, level two threat, let's stick with the fire theme. Um, I might hear sirens in the neighborhood. Now I have a different reaction to that. It still isn't going to stop me from working, but I probably am gonna be distracted by it, especially if there's evidence of activity related to the fire trucks and the firefighters in my area. Every 20 minutes or so, I might go to the window or the door, see what's going on, see if there's a neighbor I can ask. And then I'll get back to work for a little while and then I'll go back. So level two threat is swinging back and forth between focus and going to solve for that unknown. It's the beginning of our fight or flight response. And a level three threat, think about a fire alarm going off in the house. I'm out of here, fight or flight, done. Forget the work, I'm out. Now these levels of threat don't have to be associated with something you can name very cleanly. It could be pandemic era stresses that are adding up for us. So there's a pandemic. We've all been at least in a level one for at least a year. You might notice that in a given day, something may happen, a uh, threat of exposure for a close family member and you spike upward. So you thought I was a one and I was doing well and I'm managing my work and all of a sudden someone calls me and says, uh-oh, here's a difficult bit of news. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm at a two or a two and a half. Now I'm, I'm gonna have a harder time buffering myself from the next threat, no matter where it comes from. And it might come from the SCARF model, okay? So it might come from a human interaction, people who have no idea that my day is at a level two and a half. So I wanna combine two things now. It's helpful to think, where am I in terms of a one, two, or three, as I go back to the SCARF model and think, how am I showing up for others? So as leaders now, having that combination of awarenesses, make a note for yourself and you'll notice this is the chart we started with at the beginning. And I asked you to pick one of these to focus on. Make a note for yourself at the bottom of the page or somewhere on the page. What's your threat level been on, on the one, two or three scale? A one, I'm pretty, I'm engaged and focused and okay, uh, maintaining focus for long periods of time. A two, I'm swinging in and out of good focus. Um, at times I'm distracted. Or a three, I cannot engage. I'm too overwhelmed. Make a note for yourself and realize that that status, one, two, or three, affects the choices you make and the intentionality that you need to bring to offering rewards through your words in interactions with others. Let me give you these examples. If you're someone who recently perhaps has dismissed ideas or contributions, instead you might invite contributions and explore shared ideas. Instead of being unclear or vague, you might be explicit with expectations and clarify often. Instead of micromanaging or being prescriptive, you might think about where you might offer some choice. Uh, for relatedness, uh, maybe you've been very business focused. How might you talk a little more about shared goals or well being or other personal issues uh, for some limited amount of time, but that might make a big difference for the people around you and for yourself? And fairness, 
how might you share your thinking process and ask for questions instead of maybe uh, short, shortening a conversation a little too abruptly? So feel free to snap a picture of that if you'd like. And, um, and I've got one more slide and my last question for you in the chat is just, I'd love to know one, one thing you wanna take away. So it might be one element of, of SCARF that you wanna work with more, more intentionally. Just go ahead and type that one word in the chat or maybe it's some other takeaway. Um, this is also a great time for any final questions. I know we're coming close to the top of the next hour, but I'll be here for a few more minutes to answer any questions that arise. So thank you. Well, Janine, as always, it's, it's wonderful to have you back here and uh, a great honor to uh, have you join the Stockdale Center series on uh, brain science and effective leadership. Um, so please, if we have any guests who'd like to pose a question to, uh, to Dr. Stewart, uh, please do so in the uh, in the chat function. And I see a question already. Great question from Jacob. How how long does the offset work? Such as could relatedness as the helper be a temporary band aid when addressing threats to others and what's needed in the long term? Um, relatedness is a is an interesting one to focus on to answer this question, Jacob, because while relatedness can work in the short term as a band aid, it also can fall away very quickly if not maintained. It's probably the one category, if you were only going to focus on one intentionally, it's the one I would say you should try to work into your practice very intentionally week after week, because if it really falls away, you're at greater risk. Um, of, of people really becoming extremely stressed and having a harder time regaining their resilience. <laughs> Chloe, I'm glad it's useful for your roommate situation. I feel the same way living with my adult daughter. <laughs> Love to you <laughs> and best wishes for that. Um, yeah, so good comments here. Thinking about how my my others and my own levels of stress, Bart says, threat level, how to alleviate using SCARF. There's actually a lot to work with there. The reward side of the SCARF equation is infinitely useful to a leader. Ah, uh, should, should an assessment like this be offered? Um, CJ, this is a great question. Uh, so I'll give you my, my personal um, bias is, the, the assessment is most useful for establishing some common language. It's not a personality assessment. That is, your situation and your context actually will drive priorities on the scarf in the scarf domains over time. So, um, so while you know, for a it may be for a three month period related, this is my absolute favorite thing. Um, I love it. I need it all the time. And it could be under a period of crisis, I shift a bit and fairness might be at the top or certainty. Um, so I hope that helps. I do think the shared language is really useful because it depersonalizes a lot of things that could otherwise escalate, if that makes sense. Ah. Uh, Eric, I think this is a great question. How, how can the SCARF model help us lead in a highly polarized society? I think this is more important than ever. Um, I think uh, one of the things I come back to is setting agreements for, for difficult conversations. I, I've been talking to a lot of people who are eager to connect with people who, who hold different points of view politically, um, have different religious traditions, and it's become so tense and difficult to do that. So how might we set up a conversation with intentionality, use certainty, for example, to say, this is how we're going to communicate. Use fairness, for example, to say, we are going to make sure that everyone's point of view is heard and respected. Um, use status to, uh, to thank and appreciate those who showed up and really tried, despite the fact that it's hard. So on the reward side, I think you see a lot of clues about how to, how to build a safe space for difficult dialogue. And maybe that'll start to give some of us um, opportunity uh, or the chance to see opportunity that we hadn't noticed before. I have loved this. This is a wonderful conversation. Thank you so very much. 
Well, Dr. Stewart, on, on behalf of the, uh, the midshipmen, the, uh, the officers, uh, faculty and staff of the U.S. Naval Academy, and especially the workers here at the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership, please accept our thanks for rejoining us here, at least virtually, uh, here in Annapolis for another discussion on brain science and effective leadership. And we hope if your schedule allows that you'll consider coming back to rejoin us again uh, in the fall to continue on with this, uh, with this broad conversation. Uh, advances in brain science are changing the way that we all look at uh, how to effectively lead other people. And uh, the Neuroleadership Institute is at the very forefront of making these very complex uh, ideas uh, digestible and approachable by us laymen. So uh, for this presentation, we send our, our gracious thanks for the people here in the audience who participated. Uh, thank you as well for making time in your busy day. And uh, we hope that all of you all will join us again for another discussion on brain science and effective leadership.